Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey Lane. Hello. So friends, we're happy to be here with you in the deep throes of winter. We're kind of in frigid weathers here and it's kind of a scary time of the year for those of us that plant and grow cool season hardy annuals. So I don't know what Lane has planned today, but I'm sure it's kind of related to that. But friends, before we jump in, just want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where you can visit anytime and find um, our fully stocked online garden shop that has the same tools, seeds, and supplies that you hear us mention here on the podcast, as well as a full lineup of online courses. So we love it when you drop in over there and let us know what you think. So what's up for today, Lane? Well, like you mentioned, Lisa, for many of our listeners, we are in the middle of winter and it's pretty cold right now. It's really cold today, isn't it, Lisa? For yes. Us. I think it might be the second coldest day this year. Yeah, it's very cold. And the questions are starting to come in about, are my cool flowers going to make it through the winter? If they don't, what caused it? And also, how can I tell if they are actually dead? So we're just going to go through the seven most common causes that we see that lead to cool flowers losses over the winter. So that way you can maybe identify them if they are unfortunately happening to you and maybe try to avoid them in the future. That's a great one, Lane. And, you know, I just want to remind everybody that first off, you can jump over to our YouTube channel and actually watch the PowerPoint program that Lane has put together with this. But I use very early spring plantings as my backup plan in the event that any of these things happen, right, Lane? And yeah, um, I've never really had that happen, but I'm always have that insurance policy in my back pocket of planting more. So this is a great topic. Yeah. All right, let's get started. Okay. So we're going to start with something that may seem a bit obvious, but it's still worth mentioning. Perhaps the cool flowers, if they didn't make it, maybe they weren't winter hardy in your zone. And maybe you did this intentionally. Maybe you were purposely pushing the envelope just in case they could make it. Or maybe you weren't aware that they weren't hardy in your zone or even that cool flowers have a hardiness associated with them. I agree, Lane. This is a really common issue. Oftentimes when people ask me about this, the first thing I say is, is it winter hardy in your zone? And it's like, what's that? So people hear about the concept and jump in and they just aren't aware. So that is definitely the easiest to resolve is to know your winter hardiness zone and the winter hardiness zone of the plant you're considering. Right. And then only fall plant those flowers that are actually winter hardy in your zone or be prepared that you are taking a bit of a risk and you might need to provide some added protection. Exactly. Okay, the next point is that maybe you did plant things that were hardy in your zone, but you had a colder than normal winter in your zone. So maybe you're in zone seven, yeah. but you actually got down into zone six temperatures. So you experienced something more like a zone six winter, even though you're in zone seven. And, you know, I this can surely happen. I mean, just right with the crazy weather patterns that we have right. today. But I will tell you that, we are so often pleasantly surprised when cool flowers go into winter as a well-established, healthy transplant, how they can really face oftentimes those adverse you know, conditions, particularly if you know that's going to happen and you take some steps. Um, for me, one of the things like this year, it's been a little bit drier in the fall and winter. Um, we try to make sure that our cool flowers are well hydrated when they're, when some of this really cold, deep, how often, I don't know about you, but when I think of it, oh, getting frozen, I don't even think, oh, I wonder if they're thirsty. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you, you think they aren't thirsty, but you can't water when it's frozen outside. But if you know that a, a cold blast is coming to check your soil uh, moisture level and do some watering so the plants go into that cold well hydrated. Um, but we find that if you give healthy plants planted in well-drained area, give them a little extra TLC, if in fact a colder than normal blast comes, 
we've had great success surviving those. And another thing you can do that we've talked about before is if you know there are unusually cold temperatures coming, you can throw an extra layer of lightweight row cover yeah. on top as long as snow or frozen precipitation is not in the forecast. That's so true. And in fact, um, you know, I have a test bed here on the farm of several cool flowers that we're not sure what the winter hardiness zone is. And so when the cold was forecasted, I went out and in fact did exactly that. I actually threw an extra cover on. Yeah. And also just a reminder that the hardiness zone map, the USDA hardiness zone map, it's based on averages over a very long period of time. So while you might be in a certain zone with your average annual minimums from zero to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, you definitely can go below there because that's why it's an average. There are going to be some times when you're right. warmer than that and sometimes when you're colder. Exactly. That's a great point. And aren't those frosty? I think that's Sorenthi oh. in that picture. Isn't that just, I just love seeing all those little ice sickles on the leaves and I was just looking at, in fact, there's some Sorenthi out in the garden that reseeded and it's outside of where our cool flowers are planted. So I decided I was going to do nothing for it. I wasn't going to protect it. Let's just see what happens. Um, and they're pretty frozen right now. We'll I see. love it. I love the look of frozen little plants. Me too. Okay. Now our next point's going to be perhaps the plants were actually too big going into winter and that makes them more susceptible to cold damage and wind damage and everything else that can come over the winter. So maybe you planted a little bit too early in the fall or maybe you planted on time and the fall warm weather just kept going and going and caused the plants to get too big. So we have been experiencing that particular problem a lot here in southeastern Virginia. The part of fall just won't stop and the plants just keep growing. And that has led me, particularly with transplants, to plant later and later each year. And I do it in like two-week intervals. Um, instead of planting six to eight weeks before our first expected frost, which is classic, um, I now do it more like four weeks before, because that just allows me to not grow these giant trans, these giant garden plants heading into winter. Um, so it's really becoming more of a challenge, I guess, not a problem, but a challenge to overcome. Right. And like you said, if you do notice this seems to be a pattern for you that your plants are getting way too big every single fall, well, maybe yeah. do plant a little later instead of planting your transplants six to eight weeks before your first expected fall frost. Like Lisa just yeah. mentioned, maybe try pushing your planting dates out by two weeks at a time until you start to more consistently end up with plants that are the size you're looking for going into winter. And that is just so true. And I'm just thinking of our friend, Emily, who lives in, she's probably 8B now, winter hardiness zone 8B. She was probably 8A. She shared with me that she plants a lot in very early spring because of this crazy behavior from fall planting. And in fact, she goes a little earlier than very early spring to take advantage of it warming up earlier. So you just have to kind of feel out and do the best you can and um, until you find what works best for you in your area. And back in episode 63, by the way, if anyone wants to go back and check that out, we talked about troubleshooting if you have cool flowers that are actually trying to bloom in the fall going yeah. into winter. And one of the things we mentioned in that is you can also start some insurance seedlings that may unfortunately be destined for the compost pile ultimately, but it's a little insurance policy for you so that if you have some plants that have gotten way too big, you can replace them. Right. And I'm sitting looking at a whole room full of insurance policies right now. And, you know, you it really depends on the scale of a farmer or a gardener or how much space you have. Um, Dave Dowling would say, you know, start them and then plant them and sell them. But you have to have the space to be able to do that. So you have to really just, again, draw that line in the sand of, all right, I want the insurance, but I'm willing to compost these plants if everything goes okay with the initial planting. And, you know, those are struggles that just go on for all of us from year to year. And you just have to do the best you can. And what is too big, would you say, going into the winter? When would you start to get concerned? Well, good question, because I am pretty sure that I know of at least two plantings out there that I thought 
I had Bobo restart them just two weeks ago thinking they are so big, they'll never make it through this weather. Um, you know, so we use row cover, not so much for cold protection, but for wind and particularly deer protection. And when I use low wire hoops, those pre-arched hoops, which you'll find those on our website, um, when the plants are covered for that protection and they're pushing the cover up, that's when you know they're too big. I mean, and I've never pulled anything out. I've always let them ride out the weather and let's see where the chips fall, right? But right now I have a Mobium that's doing that as well as um, Godisha, and of course, until the deer ate it down. Um, mm -hmm. And I had taken the cover off for that very reason. And so we'll see what actually happens. Um, but I just wait and see what the, what, how it turns out and address it after the fact. I never preempt pulling plants out. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to move to the other end of the spectrum. Perhaps the plants were too small going into winter and they didn't have enough time to get established before really, really cold temperatures and winter weather set in. And, you know, this is a really great one, Lane, that we don't often talk about very much, but it is a really common issue. So with this is a, an image of some direct sown bells of Ireland and they're tiny. And what's wrong with tiny plants? Well, they don't have a big enough root system. They don't have anything to stand on. I mean, that's like putting them out in the ocean with, you know, one little floaty on one arm and expect them to make it right. Um, so with direct sowing, that's the problem. And I was going to mention earlier and I forgot um, so with transplants is where I push the window a little bit closer to our frost date. I can't really do that with direct sowing. Direct sown seeds need enough time to get bigger and more established. They need a little bit of warmth. So you can't really push that window. Um, so direct sown stuff that just doesn't have a great root foundation, will never survive winter most often, especially if you hit a really cold um, area, but not established. Just, I mean, just saying that not established cannot face adverse conditions. They just have no foundation to stand on, basically. What is the ideal size, would you say, going into winter in a dream world? So funny you should say that because I have a section of snapdragons that were planted later than all the rest. And I was just videoing them the week before last and said, this is the perfect case scenario. They were about six to eight inches tall. They were starting to, you could see where the, they weren't pinched. The central stem was there and you could see new shoots starting at the base but they were like frozen in time because it was cold, you know, yeah. and that's just really perfect. Um, so, you know, getting them in the ground or sowed about four weeks before they have to stop growing and going dormant, because that's what cold season hardy annuals do, right? When they go into winter is they just kind of put on, they hibernate. Think of a bear going to sleep, you know, for winter hibernation, and they have to have some substance to rely on during that downtime. And um, no, it is not easy to figure out. And friends, that's when your skill as a farmer or a gardener comes into play. You just have to do the best you can and figure it out. And be observant and take good yes. notes so that yes. you remember the next year because you'll think you're going to remember and you no, won't you don't. remember. <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now we're going to move on to probably the number one cause of cool flowers death over the winter, and that's going to be poor drainage. I think that we all fall victim to this every year, even when we know, um, because we think, oh, it's in a little raised bed. I don't see, I don't see water puddling. I don't see standing water. And you think you're in the clear, but in fact, that's not really true. Um, if you know, one of the benefits of I have found for cool season hardy annuals is you don't have to irrigate during the winter because it snows and rains more often for us. But in addition and in conjunction with that, the soil just never really dries out if it just gets really good and wet one time. Well, that's there's two sides to that sword. The other problem is that 
they get wet frequently and they just never really dry out. And that just creates the perfect conditions for disease to develop. And this, the image that you have up for this is a beautiful bed of well-established Lysianthus transplants. And they are some of, I mean, I find that I could name, it's like, I think to myself, oh yeah, Lizzie's the most susceptible. Well, not really. Larkspur, Bupleurum, Sweet Peas, really all of them are very susceptible, but some of them, damn, they kind of um, hurt you a little bit more than others. Losing Lizzie to disease is incredibly um, painful for farmers. A, they're just a high value crop. Um, so good drainage means that I try to plant in the tallest beds possible. If I could get eight inch raised beds, yeah. I would do it for cool flowers um, because the what you really just want absolutely no underground retention of moisture um, and more than you can, than your actual high organic, soil. And I, when I say organic, I mean a lot of organic matter in it that works like a sponge. It holds moisture, but it doesn't puddle. That's what you're looking for. And this takes out so many cool flowers and people tend to blame it on the cold, but in fact, it's just wet feet. And that's one of the reasons you actually typically plant your Lysianthus only in very early spring, even though it's winter hardy in your zone, yes. but the drainage issues over the winter can lead to some unnecessary losses. That's a great point. I'd kind of forgotten about that. And so we, Bobo and I did a test, I think it's three years ago now, where we planted in the fall, we planted in very early spring, bed, side by side in a bed or two beds side by side, same varieties, fall planted, very early spring planted. And in fact, we found no huge difference in stem length or abundance and performance from those planted in very early spring compared to those fall planted. However, we lost probably 10 to 20% of the fall planted plants from overwintering those conditions that just happen, you know? And so sometimes timing, it's more to consider than just fall planting. You know, there's other things that can affect your plants. Yeah. So some things to help improve the drainage in your beds, obviously incorporating some organic matter whenever you can will help to improve your soil over time. Planting in raised beds, like Lisa mentioned, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a structure of a raised bed. It right. could just mean that you've piled some soil up in areas, right? Yes, that's exactly right. None of our beds um, out in our big gardens have structures. They're all what we refer to as mounded beds. So you can build a structure or a non-structured bed. Um, but yes, you're right. The point is to just get the plant's surface above the ground surface. And then as always, remember not to be walking on your beds because you're going to be compacting the soil even more. And that can also result in drainage issues. Exactly. All right. The next point is going to be perhaps your little plants got smothered. Now, if it's just snow on top of them, we've talked many times that that's perfectly fine. And snow is actually an excellent insulator. But for example, if you had row cover up and then snow piled on top of the row cover and collapsed it, that could smother your plants. Yes. And as this image reminds me of a year that we were caught off guard and you can see that all of the row cover and wires are collapsed under that snow. And so row cover on top of your plants with snow on top of it can turn your plants to mush. Um, and that can happen. And it has happened to us. Um, so if any threat of frozen precipitation is forecast, taking your covers down is the best case scenario. Another potential smotherer is a really thick layer of leaves. Have you ever experienced plants getting smothered by leaves? Yes, yes. Um, you know, where sometimes um, we, we use leaves in the pathways. And if I were to mulch those pathways with the leaves too early in the developing direct sown seeds in the bed, um, they can blow up on the bed and just, they just create a mat and the seedlings just can't get out. 
Um, and that's one reason that I really like to mulch pathways for direct sown beds later than earlier. That's what led me years ago to even try landscape cloth in the pathways, which I found that there were bigger issues with that than keeping the leaves off my bed. So our resolution to that is we mulch the pathways later to allow the plants to get up and get a little size to them, or we use chips, which is the case that we did this year because we had chips available to us. All right. And our final point of things that can cause your plants to not make it through winter is what I'm calling animal intervention. So that could be, <laughs> it sounds so fun, right, Lisa? Yeah, <laughs> it's not though, is it? <laughs> it's not. So that could be anything from things eating it from the top, rabbits or deer eating them to the ground or pulling the seedlings or plants completely out of the ground or squirrels digging them up or from below, voles could come and eat them or even things could just tunnel beneath them and create a big airspace under there, even if they exactly. don't eat the actual plants. Yes. I mean, and I will say that, you know, through the years, I've experienced all of those. And this year particularly seems to be one of those years of tunneling, not in our big garden, but over in our big raised um, Joe beds. There is a mole that is just really creating havoc all around. Um, and those things just happen and you just have to find a resolution to it. Um, but deer eating stuff to the ground um, and rabbits can be a really big problem because, again, during the winter, vegetative growth on the top of the plant isn't really going to happen in cold conditions. So they get eaten to the ground. They have no vegetation and then they don't have anything to I mean, there's just nothing to sustain the top. It's the opposite of not established. Instead of not having roots, they don't have a top. Sometimes they'll make it. You never know till you try it. We've had um, billy balls, which is the Craspedia image on the left, which I have found to be really a deer magnet. Um, one year they ate them all to the ground and we started a whole new batch. Um, and guess what? It all re-sprouted and grew, but the next year that didn't happen. So you just, it's all about the conditions you know, and it varies. And I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. We just start more and move on because there's just too many variables. Yeah. And at least in terms of animals getting at it from the top, sometimes it can deter them. If you can put a lightweight row cover up, like we yeah. mentioned, that can sometimes stop them. Not always. Yes. The image on the right is Godaisha, which we also find to be, um, it's one of our new favorite cool flowers, new to us as a cool flower. Um, it is so very beautiful and it's a strong brancher. And we learned that because the deer ate it to the ground and pinched it basically, and it regrew beautifully. But just know that Godaisha, like Craspedia, is really a magnet for deer. Um, and so you have to find a way, however you control deer. And I think rabbits also find Godaisha particularly tasty. Oh, yeah. I have found rabbits to be less picky even than deer. It's true. It's true. So then I just wanted to talk very briefly about how you might be able to determine if your plants are alive or dead, which there's nothing sure about this. You never can 100% tell till spring comes around. If they look like a frozen popsicle right now, that is normal. <laughs> it is so normal, Lane. Um, so first off, as I mentioned earlier, I never preempt remove plants. I always, it's like, I just wait until the, the plants start regrowing that season. You know, for us, that's like usually in March where they start to kind of do a little sprouting. I wait until that starts happening around the garden before I terminate something I suspect hasn't made it. Black mush is kind of a bad sign. Somebody yeah. just asked me that um, the other day on social media and, um, you know, so I never preempt. Um, and sometimes I'm surprised by what regrows. It just depends on really, again, the plant and the conditions. But I will tell you a um, short story. So years ago, when I was first experimenting and learning about what we now call cool flowers, I had planted, I had had my first year of flower farming. I was a huge success, just meaning I sold everything. 
So I planted a ton more and committed myself to, you know, my floors. It's like, oh, I'll have tons more next year, yada, 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 you know, not knowing because I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, planted a ton of snapdragons, which was is a huge cash crop. Well, in January of that year, because I fall plant snaps, I went out and peeked under the covers. And I'm telling you, I can still remember running in the house and calling Suzanne, my sister, and saying, Oh my gosh, Suzanne, all the snapdragons are dead. They're frozen. Oh. They're they're just, I mean, those they're like little, they're like little dead soldiers out there. She'll <laughs> say, Well, go start more. So I literally did two things. And you may have even seen an image of this somewhere, Lane. Um, I did two things. I started more snapdragons to plant somewhere else in my garden. And I sowed some nigella seeds because back then um, I used, back, believe it or not, back in, this is so back in the beginning, I actually was planting in landscape fabric. My experimental oh. year of that, I sowed nigella seeds into the holes where the snapdragons were. Oh, and lo and behold, March came along and then April and we had the most beautiful regrown snapdragons you've oh. ever seen with nigella blooming amongst it. There's a lot of images of this um, in our old libraries and, and, and galleries. Um, but so I thought they were dead, but lo and behold, they weren't. So don't waste your time replanting what you think are dead until they're proven dead is the moral to my story. Yeah. Plants are tough. So don't judge them yeah. prematurely. And this is exactly. also why we always recommend planting more than you need. And also for direct seeded things, waiting to thin those out until they start yeah. to show signs of growth in early spring, just because some of them might not make it through the winter. You know, the stuff just happens. So, you know, I try to give plants the last benefit of the doubt, but then you have to do it. You have to move on for the greater good. How about if a plant is quite large and some parts of the plant are brown and have died back, but there's still some green lower down on it? Probably going to be fine. Um, you know, that's something that I would wait again until warmer conditions start to happen and a little regrowth. And then you just cut the plant back like you would cut as a stem you were cutting, you know, cut deep. And um, so that plant doesn't have to try to struggle to support that part of the plant that might not be in great condition. So don't be discouraged. You might be pleasantly surprised yes. or you might not, but hopefully you can try to potentially avoid some of the losses, but it's really just a part of growing cool flowers. Exactly. And the benefit is worth all the, the figure now. It is. All right. Well, that does it for this episode. I hope that helped identify some potential causes of plant losses, which we hope you're not suffering. But if you are, like we said, just know that it's just all a part of the process. So don't be discouraged. But thank you so much for joining us again. And if you're enjoying Seed Talk, please make sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're watching or listening and be sure to share it with a friend. And just thanks again for joining us. Yes. And remember, friends, 26 years in and I'm still suffering from many of the ups and downs of cool flowers because not all of it is in our control, but it is worth right. trying to provide what they need as best you can for the reward in spring um, of great flowers growing out in your garden. So remember, thegardenersworkshop.com is where you can learn more about the work that we're doing. And we just hope that you will join us over there and that we'll meet again. Thanks, Lane. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Bye.